What are biosolids? Well, when wastewater comes into a wastewater treatment plant, two primary end products come out. The clean water, the effluent, and biosolids. Um, as wastewater is treated and is treated with mic uh, microbes, those die off, you have to keep a balance and you waste them and you get the solids. Okay, and just a little bit more, it is defined in the dictionary. Just to let you know where the term biosolids came from, it was uh, an industry developed term back in the uh, 1990s. They asked for the wastewater industry for suggested names and it comes from biological solids is what somebody suggested. And what they, what they, there's so many terms that use the word sludge, um, they wanted to get away from some of the connotations. So when people say, oh, it was a term to make it sound better, a little bit, yes it was but it does have some basis in, in what the term is. Uh, our past rule used the term domestic wastewater residuals. The federal regulations used the term sewage sludge, uh, but you'll see a lot of federal documents that use the term biosolids. Uh, what's in biosolids? Um, the organic solids, and when we say organic, we mean carbon-based solids. Um, nutrients, uh, there's potential for pathogens, depending on what level the biosolids are treated, and then other pollutants in the in the biosolids, metals, um, other, other contaminants. Okay, now when a wastewater treatment facility treats its wastewater, it has a number of options of what it can do with its biosolids. It could landfill them, it could transfer them to another facility for treatment, it could treat them to a certain level and land apply them, or it can treat them to a higher level and sell it as fertilizer. It is the potential to incinerate it. We don't have any facilities in Florida right now that incinerate biosolids. And then bioenergy is a potential source. You might hear people say, oh, why don't facilities just convert to gasification or something else to use the biosolids to create energy? That is still something that has not really been fully developed. When you hear of successful bioenergy projects, they're usually just anaerobically digesting them to collect the methane. You still end up with biosolids. It may reduce the volume just a little bit, but you still have something you have to take care of. Okay. And then we permit the facilities for what they're going to do. And there's, all these options have pros and cons. All of them cost money. Some cost more than others, but when they cost more than others, sometimes it gets them out of certain requirements. So there's, there's a trade-off on, on every single one of these options. And there is no one silver bullet on what to do with biosolids. Okay, really there's three primary uses of biosolids or three disposal methods for biosolids in Florida. Um, and it's pretty even right now. About one third of the raw biosolids in Florida end up being distributed and marketed after being treated. One third end up being treated to a, a different level and land applied at permitted sites. And then about one third go to Florida landfills. What's kind of interesting about the landfill number is Currently, the landfills are the ones that will accept biosolids are pretty much operating at taking as much as they can take right now and still function well operationally. They can only take about 10% of their volume a day in biosolids. Otherwise, because the biosolids are wet cake, the equipment can get stuck and they have, they have issues. We also get some biosolids, class AA biosolids, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, all pelletized coming in. Uh, being bought usually by Florida fertilizer companies and blended into um, fertilizer blends. That used to be a much bigger number. Um, some of the companies that used to import larger quantities, uh, one big facility shut down. Um, they've been finding markets closer to home and some have been sent to cement kilns as fuel. So let's talk about, as we just mentioned, those three categories. The three, let's talk a little bit more about distribution and marketing, and that's the sell and give away of biosolids as a fertilizer. We only have about 35, maybe 37 facilities right now that do that, because to treat the biosolids to a class A, class AA level, that is basically virtually eliminate the pathogens, it usually takes heat. There are a couple processes that don't use heat, but they're still expensive as well. And so you really need that economies of scale in order to be able to treat um, the biosolids to that level at an economic, um, economically. 
Uh, we do have a wide variety of class AA processes in Florida. We have the pelletized, we have heat dried, we have some lime pasteurized, we have some that are treated with chlorine dioxide, we have um, some that come out in a liquid form from digesters. So we have all different forms of class AA. It's just not all pelletized. Um, we do have an, uh, an ongoing slow trend to class AA. Um, years ago, it was a smaller class AA portion, but also years ago, it was a lower landfill portion. But different factors, whether it be local ordinances, state rules, cost of gas to truck material, uh, cost of nitrogen uh, for farmers, it, it's always in play on what what facilities are going to do uh, with their biosolids. Um, under our 2010 rule revisions, we did, because the concept of when you treat it to class AA that you can sell it or give away, we never had a requirement that they actually become a Florida fertilizer. So now we have a requirement that this material has to be sold under a fertilizer license or sold or given away to somebody with a Florida fertilizer license. So now that kind of evens the playing field um, from some complaints we'd kind of had in the past of, well, you're not really treating them like fertilizers, you're giving them a pass. So, um, and a lot of AA facilities now are showing up on the Florida Fertilizer Tonnage Report, and then a lot doesn't because a lot of those, like I said, the pellets from out of state, a lot of pellets that are produced in state, some of the compost, they're sold to Florida fertilizer companies and then blended into custom blends. And so I've seen most of the names of the large Florida fertilizer companies um, come through on when people provide the, the fertilizer license for uh, what facility, well, for the facility for where they're going to be shipping their biosolids. This is just an example um, of the pelletized. Green Edge is a Florida company. They sell JEA's uh, uh, biosolids. They're the only Florida company that bags some biosolids. I don't know if you're familiar with Melorganite. That comes in from Milwaukee, that's biosolids. There's also heat drying, Ocala heat dries. Uh, City of Tallahassee did heat dry, but they weren't very happy with the end product. It was a little too dusty, so they, uh, they've switched to pelletization. Uh, there's, like I mentioned, the nut other forms of, of class AA. The anaerobic digester um, usually comes out as a liquid. Uh, we do have um, different processes that use high heat and high pH to, to create a, a product as well. Okay, so that was kind of an overview of distribution marketing. And now we'll talk a little bit about land application, the other, one of the other third chunks in there. Um, when I say land application, I really mean land application at a permitted site following a nutrient management plan. Um, why do we allow it? Well, biosolids have the nutrients in it that help the, the crops, and then it has the organic matter that helps the, the soil. So it usually is used to improve the soil and fertilize the crops. It's a low cost option for, for farmers because they usually they get it delivered for free by the wastewater treatment plant. And traditionally, land application has been a lower cost option for most wastewater treatment plants as certain things like back in 2008 when fuel prices went up, kind of drove up the cost of land application because of the treatment, so some facilities shifted back to you know, landfilling. It just varies. Um, we have about 95 permitted sites in Florida right now. Usually the biosolids company, the hauler, is the permittee of the site. Um, we do have some sites that are permitted by the wastewater treatment plants. I think we only have one site where um, the landowner decided to be the permittee. Okay, and just a big picture overview. Most of the biosolids come from the big cities. You know, we're the ones that produce it. And because it is used, when it is beneficially used, it's used for agriculture. All the uh, agriculture is located in the rural areas, which does end up bringing up some issues when people who live next to these land application sites wonder why, if the material is so good, why is it coming to my county? Why aren't the cities keeping it and using it themselves? Well, the land is out there. And not always the prettiest. This is liquid land application. Um, cake application, you can see it's delivered in, in big trucks, and that's a kind of a point I was going to make on the last slide is, because this material is about 5 to 6% nitrogen, 
a um, couple percent phosphorus. It has a lot of water content when it comes in as a cake. Um, it takes probably um, maybe two of those semi, uh, two to anywhere from two to four of those semis to fertilize an acre of land for the year. So it can be a lot of volume of trucks coming into the land application sites. Okay, so we've kind of talked about those categories and we'll, we'll get into a little bit of the background of the rules. The rules allow three classes of biosolids. Class B, which is the minimum treatment. Class A, where you've treated it for the pathogens, and then class AA, which is the highest quality. The only real difference between AA and A is the rule limit for the metal concentrations. Basically, in Florida, all the biosolids are pretty much low in metals, so if somebody provides the treatment to eliminate the pathogens, um, it's almost assured that they're going to qualify for class AA. In fact, we just had a facility recently, they're coming in for a permit, they're installing a class A uh, pathogen reduction process, and that's all they asked for in their permit application. I saw the draft permit, I asked the district, what, what are, why aren't they asking for AA? And they said, I don't know, they, that's all they asked for, and they were pretty, pretty adamant about it. And then finally, as they're about to get their permit issued, they're like, oh, no, no, we really want AA because we qualify for it. So, because A, you still have to use a permitted site, you still have to follow a nutrient management plan. But um, the class AA, because it is distributed and marketed as a fertilizer, there is no restrictions from us on its end use. If a farmer's following a Department of Agriculture BMP, then, then you know, those will still apply just like it's a fertilizer. Okay, now these different classes and these different uses, the regulations are kind of set up to be stricter on certain things depending on how it's used and what, what class of biosolids it is. So, uh, the three things it's gonna protect from or what that the rules are designed to protect from are pathogens, uh, nutrients, and then the contaminants, which uh, we only really regulate the metals based on the risk assessment. But for pathogens, I mentioned the class B and the class A. Uh, class B is a significant reduction of pathogens. Uh, and then class A, it's been treated to basically reduce the pathogens to an undetectable level, uh, basically eliminate the pathogens. And then in addition to the pathogen treatment, the biosolids have to meet a vector attraction reduction option. And that is, it's gone through some, it meets some standard that will uh, make it less attractive to insects, birds, um, other things that could come into contact with the biosolids, wildlife, and then transmit it uh, off the site if there is a pathogen in the biosolids. Um, other things for, uh, related to the pathogens, the, Class B biosolids have some extra site restrictions, uh, harvesting restrictions, which basically, because those times are so long for anything that touches the ground when it grows or in the ground, basically pasture land and hay crops are the only thing that biosolids are used for. They can be used for citrus grows. We do still have one left. We used to have more uh, because the citrus is in the trees. Uh, it's not touching the ground as it grows. So it's only a 30-day restriction for that. But because the other restrictions for other crops are so extensive, Class B is really only used for hay crops and pasture. And these site restrictions, there's public access restrictions, and that's all to let the pathogens that are remaining in the biosolids die off from just exposure to the elements. Okay, nutrients, land application, those permitted sites, they have to follow a nutrient management plan and they, those have to be based on the crop needs for those nutrients. Um, the class AA biosolids, like I mentioned, because they are fertilizers, just like if you went and bought another fertilizer, there's no restriction from us on what that end use is. Uh, although we did slip something in the rule years ago that said if you were to take and leave a big pile of it on your property, I think one dry ton for more than seven days, then it really, it's only if it starts to cause a problem, if it runs off or starts to cause an odor issue, but it's basically you need to store it properly. Um, for nutrients, we have a number of site restrictions in our rule that works also for the next topic I'm gonna do, but 
Setbacks to surface waters, we require a two foot of unsaturated soil to the groundwater at the time of application. Um, we limit the site slopes, although most of Florida is flat, which is a very interesting thing because we're, f we're so flat, our site slope limitations seem real restrictive compared to say Pennsylvania where it's a lot more hilly and so we limit slopes um, to no more than 8%. I think they allow up to 15 or 20% for the site slope. Other pollutants, um, our, our limits in, in our state rule are the same as the federal rule. They did an extensive risk assessment years ago. They looked at not just metals, but other um, pollutants as well. And they did a risk assessment based on the potential exposures. And they came up with 10 metals to regulate. They got challenged in court about one, so it's down to nine. Um, and then, for those nine metals, they developed two categories, what could be in the biosolids themselves, and then for the land application sites, what could build up over a lifetime. What's in the biosolids themselves, that's where we have that difference between the class A and the double A. You have ceiling limits that all biosolids have to meet, and then you have the more restrictive class double A limits, which, um, like I said, in order to be sold as a fertilizer, have to be met. And those are again based off of the risk assessment the risk, and I'll go ahead and mention the risk assessment now. I looked at 14 different pathways. Most of the limiting pathways were direct ingestion of the biosolids by a child. Um, there are a few that are set on environmental pathways, but um, let's see. And again, those same site restrictions, the site slope because they're minimizing runoff, uh, the depth of the groundwater, minimizing the, the or you know, maximizing the the time for anything to leach all work to help protect from pollutants as well. Okay, so I mentioned the concepts behind the regulations. These are the actual regulations at the federal level. It's part 503. Uh, we are not delegated part 503. So EPA still enforces part 503 in Florida. In fact, only eight states in the country are delegated part 503. So EPA enforces part 503 in 42 other states. Um, our state rule, Chapter 62640, uh, it is based on 503, but it does have a number of other requirements in it that Part 503 doesn't have. And then there's a third level of, of regulations in Florida, and that's local ordinances. Uh, local ordinances are allowed in statute um, by the legislature. So we, uh, we don't enforce it, and I'll mention later, we don't enforce local ordinances, but we certainly um, respect the right for counties to have, have ordinances on biosolids. Okay, I already mentioned some of these about Part 503. It was a very extensive risk assessment. And I'm sorry I have to mention this, is I don't know if you followed any about the adoption of the water criteria recently. Uh, there was a lot of criticism of, of using the Monte Carlo probabilistic method. Well, back after 503 came out in 93, at uh, that same time was when the Monte Carlo probabilistic uh, risk assessment method was coming out. And when you see part 503 was based on outdated science, that was primarily the thing. They were a little irritated that 503 was used a deterministic method of risk assessment. And um, so it was interesting to hear the public comments that they were upset that the water criteria were being based on a Monte Carlo one when the criticism of 503 is it's not based on the Monte Carlo um, risk assessment method. Um, and Ashley, I think 503 would really go the same way. If you use the Monte Carlo risk assessment method, I think some of the limits would actually increase uh, and not decrease. Um, anyway, for pathogens, it wasn't a risk assessment. It's, it's very, very hard to do any kind of full epidemiological um, study on what the potential risk would be. So they're all technology-based standards for the pathogens as well as some of the site restrictions are just good practices. Uh, 503 is actually considered self-implementing, so EPA does not issue permits, they just enforce the rule. Um, and again, I mentioned we're not delegated. One thing about 503 is it does not address phosphorus. The requirement in 503 to do an agronomic rate um, for land application, uh, the definition of agronomic rate is based on nitrogen. Okay, so our regulations first came out in 1984. Oh, I, I wanted to say one other thing. K 
came out in 1993. Just to dispel any other myths, if you see a lot of criticism of biosolids, it's like land application um, didn't exist prior to 1993. No, land application was very well established. Most of Florida's biosolids were land applied uh, prior to 1993. What it was was EPA was sued over the years to come up with biosolids regulations because land application was a well um, established practice and citizens wanted more restrictive requirements for biosolids land application. So. Okay, our regulations first came out as solid waste rules back in 1984, uh, but kind of to match what EPA was doing, which was shifting the regulations for biosolids to the water side of the house. Um, that's what happened in 1991 when chapter 62640, back then 17640, where it was uh, promulgated in 1991, was to shift it from solid waste to the water section. Um, like I said, it has a lot of the same components that 503 has. We have the same metals limits. We have um, the same pathogen reduction requirements, vector attraction reduction requirements. But we still also have a lot of areas covered that a lot of them originated in the 1984 rule. Um, we also now also address phosphorus, which part 503 does not. And we've, we permit our sites. 503 self-implementing doesn't issue any permits. Okay, so there's two main places where the activity was, activities with biosolids happen, and we regulate both of them. Uh, the treatment facility, where they actually treat the biosolids, monitor them, verify their, their metals content, and they keep the records for the, for the biosolids. And then they also report to us. Um, we also permit the sites where they're land applied. Um, the site permitting requirement is relatively new. We'd always approve the sites and we approved them by facility. So if you had one site being used by 10 facilities, we approved it 10 times. We got 10 different reports on the site. If they didn't all use the same zones at the site, we got 10 different reports. So now we permit the sites. Um, we require them to have a nutrient management plan and we require the reporting from them. So we get one concise report each year from the sites. Okay. And so this is a little more detail on the land application sites and their permitting. Uh, they do have to submit a permit application to us. We do have a provision that if a site is used by a single facility and only that facility, then the site can be permitted through that facility permit. But if more than one facility is going to use the site, we want an individual site permit. Um, they have to have um, a nutrient management plan and we'll cover a few more details about the nutrient management plan on the next slide. Um, again, all those site restrictions I mentioned, the site slope, the depth of groundwater, all those are checked. Um, and again, we, we decided not to require the landowner to be the permittee. Um, and I think only, uh, I don't know if it's Deseret or Desiree, Desiree Ranch is the only permittee of their own land application site. All the others are permitted either by a wastewater treatment plant or a biosolids company. And this is just an example of a site. This is um, not the largest, Deseret is the largest, but um, this is Deer Park Ranch and it spreads a little bit over Osceola and Brevard counties. It has 30 application zones. It's um, not quite 6,000 acres, it's 5,736 acres. And you see all the odd, all sh odd shapes of the uh, zones and that's all because of our setbacks to wetlands and surface waters and residences and drinking water wells. Okay, the nutrient management plan, we wanted to really formalize that, so it has to be prepared by a certified nutrient management planner or a professional engineer. Um, and then it details all the, de um, how the biosolids are supposed to be used at the site, what they're for, some of the operations, but the heart of it is those, new or those application rates that are based on the nutrients that are in the biosolids and what the crops are being grown at the site, which again, like I mentioned, it's usually pasture or hay crops. Um, and then I have a slide on the Northern Everglades and estuary program. So we'll talk about that when we get there. Now the phosphorus index, we require in the nutrient management plan for a phosphorus assessment. 
And why do we do that? Because biosolids have generally around 5% nitrogen and 2.5% phosphorus. Well, fertilizer, recommended fertilizer rates generally require only one-fourth the amount of phosphorus as nitrogen. So when you're land applying biosolids, you're usually applying more phosphorus than the crop needs, which, you know, it all also depends on the availability of the phosphorus. A lot of the phosphorus is bound up just like a number of the metals are, so it's not as readily available. Um, but that's the, the, the basic theory. So what we put into our rule, which was we had to be careful because there are federal rules out there and there are certain restrictions we have with adopting things into our rules that aren't in federal rules. We refer to the phosphorus index, the Florida phosphorus index that is used by uh, Florida NRCS, that's part of USDA, and developed between them and the University of Florida and other stakeholders. And what it is, is it's a field by field tool to look at how much you're of a, really it was developed for organic waste, how much um, you're putting on there and is that site based on the amount you're putting it on, how you're putting it on, and then the characteristics of that site, what type of soil it has, uh, what the groundwater level is, what the slopes are, what the risk of migration of that phosphorus is off the site. So we do have that in our rule. Not the hardest thing to pass, and one of the things that does need to be updated, uh, NRCS has been working on trying to get that update. I'm not sure when, when it will happen, but I think sites that would have failed the P-index, the, the companies that do land application decided not to even pursue those sites. So they've been picking sites that are better for phosphorus or they've, they, um, it's not the hardest thing to pass. So, let's see. Okay, other just requirements. We require the record keeping of how much is delivered to the site on each zone, how much is put there. We, because the metals have limits, we require tracking of the amounts of metals as well, in addition to the, um, the annual nutrient loadings. Um, one of the hardest things to regulate about these sites is the objectionable odors pro prohibition. It's in our air rules. We refer to our air rules. It's, it's very hard to verify odors and to um, take action on them, but it is in there, and that is generally the, the primary complaint we get is, is on odors. And because these are permitted sites, we do conduct uh, site visits. We do do um, compliance investigations. When we do get a, a complaint, we do send someone out. Now these are our setbacks, and these are, like I said, one of the primary uh, what, what it does is with the runoff provisions, you know, it, it minimizes, it doesn't eliminate, but it minimizes the potential uh, migration of the nutrients off the site. Note that in the, fortunately most of these came or were based on our 1984 rule. Um, the federal rule only has a 10 meter setback, so 33 feet. So all of these are, are much larger than 33 feet. Um, and I mentioned most of these. We do have some, a notification there at the end. If molybdenum, which basically for the metals, including molybdenum, based on how much is actually in the biosolids, it's going to be a couple hundred years to several hundred years to maybe in a thousand years before any of these reach their limits. But we did put a, a requirement in our role that if the molybdenum, the cumulative loading at the site reached the limit, then they would have to notify us. There is a notify, uh, notification to DAX if cattle are grazed within the 30 days, just so they know later down the road if any cattle end up being sick, then um, they can trace it back. Molybdenum, what it does is when the cattle uh, ingest soil when they're eating, it can cause a copper deficiency because it blocks their absorption of copper. So they just need um, vitamins, copper vitamins to, uh, to counteract that. Okay, we do have, these were all nuisance based, at least the first two, the alkaline treated biosolids, we have some more stringent requirements for that uh, because we had had odor problems with lime treated biosolids. Storage, if they were storing it too long and too close to houses, there would be odor problems when they went to go finally spread it, so we have some restrictions on that. And then for biosolid sites, you should see a sign at the front notifying you that it's a biosolid site and then if it's not a fence site around the site, there should be these signs. 
The Northern Everglades, back in 2007, uh, requirements were passed in uh, 373.4595. Basically, if you were land, an, an applicant for a site, had to demonstrate that there would be uh, the same quantity of phosphorus exported on, in products generated on the site um, as was being brought onto the site um, through the biosolids. And that would have amounted to seven pounds of phosphorus per acre. So it wasn't economically viable for people to land apply. So all these sites we'd originally had, I guess, around 43 sites back in 2007. There are no sites in these three watersheds in the Lake Okeechobee, um, which includes the Kissimmee River, the Caloosahatchee, and the St. Lucie River watershed. This is a map of the current biosolid sites. And as you can see there where the Kissimmee River is, you have a bunch on one side and a bunch on the other. But um, this map, if, um, and I can send anybody a copy of this presentation, it's public record. Um, Mr. Hitchcock has it too if you need a copy, or uh, he also has a PDF version. That link there will take you to our map direct uh, feature, and it works really well. You can click on these sites, get them identified, go in and see what documentation is on the sites. There are a few sites if they're permitted by the facility where you might not see the documents. You might have to find out what facility uses it and go to, go to their, um, go look them up in order to get documents for it. But, um, it's a very neat feature. It, it, there's a lot of other things besides biosolid sites that you can look up uh, through MapDirect with the department. This is just a graphic of the counties that have ordinances. Most of these ordinances are old, but they came about back one, one set when EPA was developing 503. Another round came, I guess, in the late 90s, and we really haven't had any since then. Most of them were the result of citizens being concerned, counties passing more restrictive ordinances. Uh, but again, we don't enforce these ordinances. And as an example, we did permit three sites in um, DeSoto County uh, last year. And none of the three are active because I don't think they've gotten county permits yet. Okay. And that kind of covers the biosolids portion, but I did want to mention this next section. Um, a lot of my activity over the last two months has been related to septage, and that is because there is in the statutes a ban on the land application of septage. It's a very, it was passed back in 2010, and it set a date of January 1st, 2016 for the ban. Um, every year there would be a bill. Um, the first couple of years none of the bills got passed. Then I think two years ago the um, Senate passed a bill to delay it. The House never took it up. Then a year ago, the House passed a bill to delay it, but they left early. The Senate was mad at them. They didn't take it up. And so all these septage haulers, all these septage management facilities thought, oh, well, it's going to be delayed at least, if not repealed. And there was a bill to repeal it this past legislative session. I should say, you know, the, and the, one of the reasons, last year when they, the Senate didn't take up the House bill, when they came back for their budget in the appropriations language of the budget bill, they put the delay from January 1st to June 30th to give themselves a chance to pass a bill. But then I guess there were some conf conflicts within the Senate, and so no bill passed this year. And now we had all these septage management facilities that didn't do anything to try to find another option, you know, staring at, oh, well, what we do with all this septage we're picking up. Um, so this is just a little bit of the background in it. It's in 381. Uh, point zero zero six five, and one of the things about it being there and, and its use of words is years ago, back in 2011, we, our attorneys looked at it and they said, well, it exempts, that, that statute exempts facilities regulated under Chapter 403. All our facility permits are issued under 403. We even have had for years um, a couple septage management facilities just because they were larger that um, we permitted. And so our attorney's uh, determination was that all our facilities could continue to receive septage, treat it, and land apply it. Um, so there's where we are right now. That's why there's a lot of activity. A lot of these facilities are coming, looking at, at getting permits. Um, there's 90 of them out there. Um, we were approached, and, and we, we, we realized that 
if everybody had to have stopped on July 1st, you would have people midnight dumping in the sewers, you would have people dumping out in the woods, in the water bodies. So DEP and DOH have been working together to try to transition these guys over um, to another option, not necessarily a DEP permit, but a DEP permit if they want one, which theoretically we have a few more requirements and would theoretically cut the land application rate in about half for them. So it would kind of address some of the nutrient concerns that the legislature had when they first passed it back in 2010. But um, these guys really don't have a whole lot of great options. Uh, not many wastewater treatment plants will take their septage. It's very high strength compared to normal wastewater, so it eats up a lot of the facility capacity and treatment ability. Um, usually the only ones that will accept it are the larger ones, which are in the big metropolitan areas. So out in the rural areas, you don't really have a wastewater treatment plant that will take septage. Um, a lot of our small biosolids treatment facilities are privately owned, and they're septage haulers, so they're not necessarily gonna accept their competitor's waste. Um, there are a few dewatering facilities out there, but again, they are usually located in the metropolitan areas because they're usually dewatering, taking the solids to a landfill and discharging the, the liquid to a sewer or with an agreement with the utility. There are a few grease facilities out there will take grease. And there's another thing. Most of these septage haulers are the primary uh, people that are picking up grease from restaurants, uh, you know, cleaning out the grease traps. Um, and then landfills can only take septage if it's dewatered. And no landfills that I know of are equipped with any dewatering equipment. So it has to go to those dewatering, those couple of dewatering facilities um, in order to be dewatered. Again, none of those exist in the rural areas. Really, the areas at risk most where this is going to affect are the, the whole across North Florida. Except as you get into the Pensacola area, they do have a large wastewater treatment plant that will take it. And then down the US 19, uh, I-75 corridor from North Florida down to, um, uh, down to Orlando and Tampa. Once you get to Orlando and Tampa, they have places. Actually, Tampa doesn't have too many places they'll take it because their biggest plant, uh, it's hard to get to because of Homeland Security. Um, it's located down at the port area. Okay. So we will permit them, and that's what this slide is really kind of about. Um, we will issue them a permit. They have to basically go through the same permitting process. Uh, we only really give them one exception, and that is uh, their treatment requirement. There's no vector attraction reduction requirement. They still have to meet the same uh, two hours for a pH of 12 that we would require a biosolids treatment facility to do. But DOH never had a vector attraction reduction, and that's always been in our rule for that, that provision. So. You know, we're giving these guys an option. As far as I know, we've had about three permitted, two or three, or they're on the verge of permitting. Have a, we've had several show interest at, at the Department of Health side. They've had seven now approved for variances because they are still making them apply for their variances. And they do anticipate a whole lot of variance requests in the next two months. But then hopefully we can get these guys to transition over as opposed to waiting until next July to, um, to do something. But now as far as biosolid sites, um, these are the primary uh, issues we see, odor. And a facility can do a really good job for years or even for a year or months, and then they have one bad odor issue, and they've sunk themselves for a while. The, the, the neighbors never forget. And so we'll get odor complaints on those sites. Uh, continually in the future. Truck traffic, as I mentioned, takes a lot of trucks to move this material because it is a very low grade fertilizer in terms of the amount of nutrient content and we allow it to be applied based on nutrient content. Um, then come, once they're aware that the, the uh, site's being used, we do get some health concerns. Um, there's never been any documented illness according to EPA and the National Academy of Sciences, based on the, if biosolids were land applied in accordance with the regulations. There are environmental concerns, obviously. It is being applied for the nutrients, and just like an agricultural site, you have that potential for loss of nutrients from the site. Um, 
The nitrogen is in a slow release form. It does have to mineralize uh, the phosphorus. There is a certain amount of it bound up. Um, so it's, it's, and like I said, we have those, those setbacks that, that help to minimize any, any migration off the site. Uh, people also get worried about property values, and they, there, there are a lot of, you know, from their perspective, genuine concerns about this waste that is coming from this other community and being dumped on them. Um, and we're, we, we understand that completely. Uh, we try to work with, it, with all, the, all the parties when, when something comes up. Uh, local government lo uh, and local ordinances, those are generally a result of everything right above with primarily the odor and the, the truck traffic. Okay, this is my information. If you want to copy this presentation, you can um, contact me or you can contact John Hitchcock. He has a, has a copy. So, any questions? Are we still bringing in biosolids from other states? Yes, that was on that one slide. It's now down to about 10 to 20,000 dry tons of, of pellets, and it's because the fertilizer companies want it. They'll, they'll, they'll buy it. Now it is, you know, at a low cost for them. Um, I don't think it's that much per ton, maybe $20 a ton. So actually the companies that ship it in, you know, they're losing money for the shipment, but they get paid up front, you know, for the treatment of it. So that's what makes it an economical model for them. But um, not as much, so our floor to produce pellets get used a lot more than, I know Tampa, they're not producing any pellets right now because they're, they're one, now their equipment's old, but they were complaining before about our cost to produce is this much and these out-of-state companies are bringing in pellets and selling it for only $20 a dry ton. Um, but yeah, we still get some. Mainly um, Philadelphia, Clayton County, Georgia, Massachusetts, yeah and Baltimore. We still get a little bit every now and then from Baltimore. So. Any, any other questions? Just real quick on the, when you were saying 200 feet to surface waters, um, how does that relate to the wetlands when, they're, when there's water there, not water, it, those kinds of things? Is it we, we, I'm not a wetlands expert, so <laughs> we ask our district who has had wetlands staff in the past to determine where the jur our, our jurisdiction line is. Now, wholly owned wetlands, we don't have jurisdiction over. The, the definition of surface waters in our state is uh, based on our 403 definition. So if there is a wholly owned wetland that doesn't connect or doesn't usually, you know, we don't, we don't require a setback. Usually the, they still maintain a slight setback to those, but they don't have to meet the 200. Yes? Is there a, I guess, a particular suite of uh, type of source material that the pilot facilities typically latch on to? Um, I'm just curious what the predominant source material for their end product is. Is it strictly salt wastewater treatment plant? Yes, yes. Yes, the, the, this is all, all biosolids. Um, now, there are a few companies. Um, CNC Peat mixes just a little bit of biosolids into their compost. Uh, they just want to improve the qualities of their compost a little bit. And so I don't know, you know whether or not they have um, what the rest of their material is. I know like Okeechobee Landfill has a composting operation and it is actually permitted under their solid waste permit. They may be mixing in food waste. It would only be the, the, the only facilities that do anything other than biosolids are some of the composting facilities, but not all. Most of them are just biosolids composting. And it would just be yard trash, you know, um, yard debris that, that it's composted with. There is a facility called Harvest Power down in Orlando that they take in a lot of different organic waste, food waste. Um, they'll, they'll take manure, they're not really located. I guess they may get some of the manure from Disney. Um, they are, they're the only other facility I can think of uh, right now. I think there are a few facilities, Broward County North got their anaerobic digester, you know, their permit to be, so they can take fat soils and grease to increase their methane. St. Pete, they've got a, a big planned operation that they've gotten an SRF loan for, and they're getting funded to take all the biosolids from their three plants to one of their plants. 
and then anaerobically digest it at high temperature. And they're looking at maximizing methane, so they want to take fats, oils, and grease as well. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm a little confused. You're talking about the, the land application sites, or you're talking about a biosolids treatment facility that's taking from. Okay. Yeah. Um, generally, they make their money on the front end, just like those out of state facilities. They'll make their money on the front end, picking up the material, treating it, and, and you know, charging the, the, the wastewater treatment plant to take it. And then, again, uh, one of the reasons, because of those out of states, the market's semi-saturated with the pellet, so it, it can't command a high, a high dollar rate. So they just make a little bit of money on, on selling the, the product. Their, their main profit is on uh, accepting the material. Um, no, there was never a move. It, 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 it would take a legislative move at the state level. Um, we would not have the authority without the legislature giving us the authority to do that. Um, and I, you know, some of the main, you know, the only thing you're really doing there is the, the pathogens. And, you know, then you're saying, okay, the site restrictions aren't effective enough for the pathogens. Um, you really, the nutrient contents are, are going to be similar. Um, there's been moves at the county levels. Uh, DeSoto County tried. They got challenged they, in court by a biosolids company. They ended up backing off. And, but they, that was kind of an interesting thing to watch. They would back off there and revise their ordinance slightly. And before they'd go to court, the, the biosolids company would take a couple new angles. The county would rise their ordinance a few days before going to court, so it would get postponed, and it, it was just back and forth until the, finally the, the biosolids company got out of DeSoto County. But I think the only county that indirectly bans Class B is Pasco County. They passed an ordinance years ago to require, not to ban Class B, but to require Class AA, and they had a Class AA county-owned facility at the time. So anything in the county could be taken there. Now. That facility's closed, so the, the, I guess all their biosolids go out of county or go to a landfill. But. One follow-up question. Do you guys uh, ever look to invest in some of this new technology to ultimately get rid of it? I know it's super critical with water oxidation and some of the schools. Well, that's been explored and it blew up, but um, Orlando was working on that, and we don't, we, we, we just want we don't really take any position on it other than that whatever the end use is, is a safe use and follows the regulations. Um, it seems like it's a big issue and nobody's really putting any money to And it's a big issue nationally. Um, you know, years ago it was a pretty hot issue here. It's a continuing hot issue in Virginia. It's a continuing hot issue in Texas. It's a continuing hot issue in North Carolina and Pennsylvania. A lot of lawsuits, a lot of activity and the end result is just like I said those five the, you know the six five or six different options there's no silver bullet for it there's whenever you start to look at one landfills are going to eventually leak um, they're lined but those liners are eventually going to going to go um, and the leachate from a landfill right now is recycled back to a wastewater treatment plant uh, if you incinerate, you get a lot more pollutants in the air, mercury being one of the concerns. So you got a trade-off with whichever, whichever method you want to go. Um, some people say make bricks out of it. Usually the bricks aren't of, as good a quality. And, and you, to get, make bricks, you have to dry it to where it would be pretty safe to use as a fertilizer anyway. It's going to be in a nice, dry, pelletized or, or granular form. So, and just wait till somebody wants to build a school out of those bricks. So. Thank <laughs> you.